This meeting is being recorded. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Mount, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Sourbread Horse and Breeders Association. I would like to thank all of our members and horse show exhibitors for joining us today. And also, I would like to uh, give a special thanks to our panel for joining us today as well. And the panel consists of David Beck, President and CEO of Kentucky Venues, Scarlett Matson, Manager of the World Championship Horse Show, Hoppy Bennett from the Kentucky State Fair Board, Kevin Moore, General Manager of the Kentucky Exposition Center, <laughs> Kevin McCoy, Executive Director of Facility Planning and Management, Sean Hensler, Executive Director of Public Safety and Security, and Ian Cox, Executive Director of Communication. Uh, Mr. Beck, would you like to uh, start things off today? Well, let me just say thank you. It's a pleasure to again have opportunity to pre uh, participate in your town hall meeting. I think this may be the second or third one that we've had, and uh, it's always good to have the dialogue, and we welcome that. I know everybody's busy, and unfortunately, we don't get to spend as much time together as we'd like to from time to time, but now we've got most of COVID behind us. We've got a little more opportunity to do some of that. I think you've had a good year this year for the celebrated industry as we try to keep up with what's going on around the country, around the state, I mean, and um, we're excited about this year's Kentucky State Fair and also the 119th World Championship Horse Show. We're very proud of this event. Not coming from the saddle red industry, uh, uh, I continue to be amazed of, of the, all that goes into it and all the people involved with it. And, and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting to know the people and learn a little bit about the industry. David, you've been helpful yourself and Mr. Bennett and others in the industry, and I really value that and appreciate that. And we welcome the opportunity today to discuss anything on your mind. I know that some of your folks have already submitted some questions and look forward to addressing those from our team. And, and let me just say this, and I mean this sincerely. Uh, we're always looking for ways to make it better. We do not want to take any, even though we're very proud of our show, the World Championship Horse Show, we want to always look for ways that we can enhance it and, and make it better. We may do things different tomorrow. We did yesterday, but we still do them for the same reason. We don't want to lose sight of that. So we're anxious to hear what's on people's minds, and we'll be able to share with you the best that we can where we are. And if we can give you a yes, we'll give you a yes. We have to give you a no occasionally. We'll explain to you why. I think knowing the why is critical so we can learn from that and figure out a way we can get to a yes, taking everyone's interest in consideration. We all make decisions based on the information we have, and unfortunately, I always – uh, I always have the same information, so it's good to share that so we can get uh, good dialogue and therefore get better solutions. All right, thank you. Um, and we have received uh, quite a few questions so far, and uh, they're broken down into um, current issues and future uh, concerns. Uh, but I would like to start off uh, with uh, a question that, that just came up over the weekend. Uh, Scarlett, can you give us an update on the stall situation in tent, tents A and B? They're now putting them up and they will be ready tomorrow, both A and B all, and all the others. <coughs> Perfect. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, I guess um, uh, the majority of the questions um, center around uh, growing the show from a facility class and horse perspective. So I'll just start off with those first before we get into current um uh, questions about the show. Uh, would there ever be an opportunity to move the show off of the state fair to take advantage of the entire facility? Who wants to answer that, Mr. Beck? I'll be glad to, to address it from my point of view. That's come up uh, uh, each year I've been here and uh, we look at the calendar and, and the booking schedule. We have 325 events on two properties, about 200 a year at KUC, about 125 at our convention center downtown. So we're either setting up for a show or moving off a show. So moving those dates around would be a, a major, major challenge to make that happen. I, I'm not going to say it couldn't happen down the road, but I'm not very optimistic. I don't want to leave any false hope there that that's a possibility. I just don't see that really happening anytime in the next few years. Kevin, you might want to address that as well, but I don't really see any opportunities to do that the way we schedule it. And part of that is how we schedule shows, how we move dirt in and out, uh, and how we manage the property from that end. I think that would be a real challenge. Uh, yeah, I agree with Mr. Beck. I think uh, most importantly, we have a longstanding relationship with the National Street Rod Association, and they are here uh, the weekend, obviously before uh, we start really loading in and setting up for the fair and, and 
Kevin McCoy and his team can, or he can speak to his team's ability, but, but putting tents up and, and having the necessary temporary stabling, uh, the, the timing just doesn't allow for that. Uh, NSRA takes a very large portion of this property. They're not out of here until uh, really Sunday night, Monday morning. Uh, and, and right now we just don't have uh, flexibility on the calendar. Uh, but from an operational standpoint, Kevin could certainly go into uh, more details if, if, if that helps you all. But in, it doesn't give us any safety net at all. So if you, you heard Scarlett talk a minute ago about the uh, stalls just going up today, well, that's not typical. So there's no room for error there. So I really think uh, we, we could get ourselves in trouble real quick. All right, thank you. And, and kind of off of the, the same line of questioning, would there ever be an opportunity to use Broadbent Arena for a second ring? Right now, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think the problem with that is um, a lot of people don't realize there's another world on the other side of Freedom Hall. And that involves cattle and sheep and hogs and so forth showing that use Broadbent and the West Wing. Uh, they stable there for them. So not, I'm like, that, that's like moving the, the show up. Uh, I don't see it in the future because we have the livestock that was very important to them at the same time. Anybody from Kentucky Venues want to add uh, to that? Okay. Um, another question uh, along the same lines. Um, several years ago, plans were announced for a new agriplex to be built behind Freedom Hall, which would allow for more indoor stabling and work areas. What is the status of that project? I'll address that <clears throat> and ask our team to share their thoughts about it. That's been discussed <clears throat> excuse me, for a number of years. And um, you may be aware of that uh, legislature put forward some money, uh, dollars that we're working with now for uh, making some major enhancements on our property. About $200 million coming in. And uh, we're, we're working with consultants now uh, to evaluate what needs we need on our property. When I first came in this row, we talked about wanting to take a fresh look at the entire acreage, you know, like you would a farm, and what's the most best use of every acre on this property. And of course, facilities are critical to that. Uh, one of our priorities is to redo uh, the West Hall. We think that's important to upgrade that. We ideally, we'd like to have a two-story where we continue to do all the livestock, but have it have appearance more like the North Wing, and and upstairs we can continue to have meeting space tied into Freedom Hall. As we've got into this study, uh, we've looked at also what we can do on the east side of the property, and Kevin McCoy's been very involved with that with some creative ideas. Uh, we need to relocate our, our maintenance buildings. Uh, we'd like to put those probably closer behind Freedom Hall area uh, for convenience. When you take a forklift and move it from one of this property to the other, you're talking about time and dollars. It's extremely expensive to do that. So moving our maintenance around would be beneficial to us. And the overall appearance of the property from the interstate varies as well. So we've got a lot of things on the drawing board. We're working with consultants. We're hopeful that in September, We'll have some preliminary plans back from them that we can look at and begin to start focusing on what the priorities should be. And then we'll discuss that with our board. We're uh, required to take that back to the legislature by December 1 of this year, uh, about what our plans are for enhancing our properties that relates to facilities and, and how we best utilize that land. So everything's on the table being looked at, but uh, Agriplex itself as an independent standalone unit with that type table, it's not really on the drawing board as such. However, all these other components would be utilized to enhance our ability to have horse shows and livestock events and other trade shows on our property. We got a 1.2 million square feet of climate controlled property. Uh, over the next five years, uh, we'd like to see that increase by probably 600,000 square feet. You know, to do that, you're talking about some new buildings and some new facilities, but we want them to be diversified, multiple use. So we can stall animals, horses, and, and do that uh, pretty much like we do the North Wing. So I think we can do that. Uh, there's ways we can do it and be more efficient. Uh, when you look at the landfill costs we have now uh, and what we spend annually on tar paper, that $200,000, and that's going up every day. 
uh, we have a lot of money going for environmental waste and all that we could do something better with. So we're trying to look at every angle of this and make the best decision, not just for the short term, but for the long term of the Kentucky Exposition Center. All right, thank you. All right, the next question um, was uh, a popular uh, theme on social media recently. Um, and I guess uh, this is more for Scarlett. Um, what, we had a lot of questions about the project for <laughs> adding and eliminating classes. Uh, can you explain that process? Well, most, a lot of times the different breeds like the Hackney Association, the ASHABA, whatever it is now, and uh, the road horses, they a lot of times send me a letter at, listing the classes they'd like to see added. In fact, if I had added all the classes that have been requested, we'd have a probably a 10 day show um, because it'd be at least two, two sessions. But mostly what we look at or what I look at is if the class has been held at other shows out in the in the world or in the United States, and they have been popular, similar to the park pleasure and the park classes. Those classes were being held at other shows and being heavy before we put them in here. Um, that's the main thing. And uh, right now we have a lot of classes. We have 230 some classes, not counting splits. Um, we have eight days, so we're pretty well full, and no one wanted to add 10 days. We discussed several years ago about adding two more days, and that didn't go over too well. So there's a lot of variables in adding classes and looking at them. You have to look at other things that entail them. As far as eliminating classes, there is a rule in the book that after maybe four or five years, a class has not been attended well, like they don't have over five or four or five entries in it that we would consider eliminating it. All right, perfect. So kind of a follow-up question, so or, or comment. Um, your advice would be just to continue to uh, support uh, these divisions across the country uh, and, and build them up to a point where um, they would be considered at the World Championship Horse Show? Well, it would also be how important, how useful and important it is to the breed. Like we added the uh, breeders challenge this year because it's trying, it's important to breeders and encouraging people to breed horses and uh, give them rewards for doing it. So there's a lot of variables. It's not okay, they're having 20 clients. Depends on what type too, you know. Right. So. Okay. I think it's um, good. I may add, okay. David, I may, I may just add to that. Sure. Our board uh, spent a significant amount of time discussing that issue and management did as well. And uh, first and foremost, we want to maintain the integrity of the World Championship Horse Show and, and, as, and not make these changes lightly. We want to make sure we're moving in the right direction with that. So, But also making sure that if a, a class is added, that it's done early enough, everybody in the industry knows how, how to benefit from that, participate in that. So we looked at the timeline when changes would be made and make sure that's fully publicized in advance so everyone can benefit from any changes that do come down the road. So it really uh, provides some order to the process. And I, I believe you received a copy of that. And uh, uh, we will make that public so everybody knows what the guidelines are for us that's making changes going forward with that. So. All right, perfect. Thank you, guys. Um, we had a couple of questions about qualifying. Um, this one was a surprise to me. The park and pleasure qualifying seems to have a positive effect on increasing entries. <clears throat> it shows that qualify for the World's Championship Horse Show. Have you considered adding qualifying requirements uh, to other divisions uh, to help other shows? We have discussed that um, about two or three years ago. It was brought up at the uh, advisory board meeting and um, they didn't like the idea. Um, they didn't approve it, didn't want to go that route. It was going to be everybody except young horse classes, two and three year old classes. But as I say, the people on the advisory board didn't think it was appropriate to do it. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, along the same lines, um, why is the qualifying deadline June 30th? Okay. 
first you have to have a cutoff. Okay, our entries close the, around the 1st of July and we have to put them in the computer. We have to see who's, who's entered. Um, and then Patricia has to get them recorded from the results from the shows before that. It takes a long time. One thing, a lot of the shows don't get their results in that early. And there's a lot of shows to get the results in. And we have, there's a rule, always been a rule, that uh, if you're not, the horse's name is not in the program, then they're not to show. And that's mainly because the program is used for people who are interested in breeding and things like that, so they can trace a horse. Uh, if you see a horse come in and he, you don't know who he is or whatever, you know, you don't know the breeding and how to go about it. Um, we have to have time to do this and to do it right. It's not, now the county fairs, you can go right up to the day of the show, but also I can't check the county fairs. It's all, that is all on people's integrity to be right and correct when they enter those classes. I have to have a way to check them. It takes time to do all this stuff. So I don't, and you have to have a cutoff date sometime. And that is right before we have, uh, you have to enter. Yep, and I can attest to the fact it's, it's difficult to get horse shows to submit the results in a timely manner. So um, that, that certainly is an issue because we're having to uh, beg and plead here in the office to get them uh, in time uh, to be counted. Uh, for qualifying, so that that is an issue. And, um, and it's, you have a year to qualify. That's true. I mean, um, you, have, you know, don't don't put him up after Louisville and not get him out and take him anywhere till June and try to get qualified. You've got a year. That's true. Yeah. Um, and I have a one follow up question that came up about um, added classes. Are are there other classes right now that you're considering? Or is it more of a wait and see? It's more of a wait and see. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, the other group of questions I have here are relating to safety, general public, and parking issues. Um, so we'll just go ahead and start. Um, the general public had access to the tent stabling area last year, some of which were smoking and trying to pet the horses. Will this be addressed this year? Okay. Yes, yeah, we did. We did. We are adding additional no smoking signs back there in the tent area, which which need to be in all the barns, not just the tents. Uh, some of the fencing will extend a little bit further, and we will have uh, the security guards back there or venue service personnel in that area, kind of direct people. But they're not really just there to keep people out of the area. Uh, it is kind of open to the public, just like the outside barns would be too. But we try to discourage it as much as we can. Thank you. Um, this is kind of uh, along the same lines. Uh, the walkway between the tents and the warm up ring last year was congested with fair goers and golf carts. Can this area be made off limits to fair goers and can a designated golf cart parking area be made in this area? So there is a designated golf cart area uh, with signage uh, back there at the back of Freedom Hall. Uh, it'll be in place again this year as well. And we do have uh, two venue services personnel at the end of either uh, end of that drive lane uh, adjacent to Freedom Hall. Perfect. All right. Uh, another tent related question. Um, the stalls in the tents had narrow aisles last year and was configured in a way that made it difficult for horses to exit. Is it possible to reconfigure the stalls to make wider aisles and have a small overhang over the outside facing stalls to prevent rain from entering the stalls. You only have so many feet to figure that all that. So we're sort of constricted to that amount, that area and do what we can the best we can. So I, I don't know how much, how wide they want them. Last year, I thought the stall, the aisles were quite wide because we had about 13 foot, but uh, if it can be done, we will. But as I say, you're restricted with a certain amount of area. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, another tent related uh, question uh, about the generator um, going offline last year that powered the tents. Um, can somebody uh, speak to that? And also what is being done this year to prevent a similar situation from happening? Okay, so the generator last year, if you're familiar with the tier four engines with, I'm sure a lot of people have farms and probably are, um, that generator had a basically a, a heater on it because they have to run so efficient. It was shut down somehow. We, we believe by somebody back there because there's a heater running back there and someone just walked by and turned it off. We did have a somewhat of a fence around it. It obviously wasn't tall enough. Uh, so we plan on doubling our efforts around that generator this year to where hopefully there's not an issue. They are designed to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we don't anticipate any issues this year. And if you see anybody around that space that shouldn't be, please give me a call. I'll be, I'll come running, I promise. All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, let's see, here's another question. There is a lot of congestion created from the tram dropping off fairgoers in front of the outside barns and Stouffer Walk. Can the tram stop be moved so fairgoers do not have, uh, get in the way of horses? So the on, only shuttle stop we have on the East Drive is down um, adjacent to Barn A. We did try to scoot it down a little closer toward the uh, South A a little bit this year, uh, but that is really the only stop in that area. Okay. And speaking of Barn A, here's another question. Uh, the general public is parking in a lot by Barn A where trainers park. Uh, the fair, the general public typically comes to the barn areas with small children causing safety concerns with horses. Is there anything that can be done about this? I'm not sure where this is, but uh, I'll defer to you guys. I know where we actually split the first double row closest to barn A, P, and U. And on one side is actually horse show parking and the other side is exhibitor parking. So that's probably where that's coming from. So it's somewhat limited in how people can get through because it's almost a solid line of concrete barricades that splits the road. So if we're getting over, they're doing that intentionally and I don't know what we can do necessarily to uh, keep that from happening. Okay, thank you. All right, let's see, we're getting more uh, questions here. All right, um, I guess this goes back to you, Scarlett, on, on qualifying. Why were the qualifying requirements changed for the Hackneys this year and not for the Saddlebreds? The Hackneys, their qualifying system is there, so they take care of that. And that was what they did. They have, I have nothing to do with them. Um, and the, the Saddlebred doesn't either. They, it's their own, that's where the, that was their decision to do it. Okay. And I was, didn't see any new need for changing hours. Got it. All right. Would it be possible for trainers to have a pass for the duration of the show that can be scanned at the gate instead of having individual tickets for each session? I think we tried that one time. And the thing of it was, is um, a lot of these trainers, they need the individual tickets to give to their grooms. They buy the gate books and they're in, you know tickets so they give it to the different ones where it's that and like the 20 passes might work for two or three grooms and then a badge would be just that one in other words it would be we would have to do just for trainers only and i don't know whether i think we discussed that too and they decided against it i mean the trainers okay perfect um, general question, where is the trailer parking this year? Is it different from last year? Um, armory lot, same, same, same location. Same as last year, armory lot, got it. Okay, um, let's see, another question from a trainer. Do trainers need a horse release form to leave the facility this year? Last year, they were not required. Not that I know of. Some of them may be able to correct me. Okay. It, it, you're correct. All right. Uh, another question from a trainer. Uh, can exhibitors in the outside stabling area go through the north wing to access their seats in Freedom Hall and the Saddlebred Cafe? Last year, many of these folks walked through Stouffer Walk and the warm-up ring, which caused a lot of unnecessary congestion. 
Yes, they can. If we've made it this year that if you have a groom's badge or a trainer's badge, you can walk through the North, uh, North Wing without any problem. In the past, we've had to give them a, a little uh, card-like thing to get them in. And also, we're going to an armband for the people who have horses in there. So, yes, they can do it. All right. And another question from the same trainer. What times will Freedom Hall be open to work horses, and when will it be closed? All right. <clears throat> Okay, on Thursday and Friday, it will be closed. I mean, this first fr Thursday and Friday, will be closed about five o'clock to six for them to clean it. Then starting the next, first Saturday, it'll be closed at noon for them to get ready for the show that night. And that means they have to fix the ring up. Um, then the Saturday or Sunday, it'll probably close about 10 or 11 until the show starts at 12. And then it'll close probably about five that afternoon till the show starts. Then from Monday through thir up to Thursday, well, let's say Monday through Friday or Saturday, it will close at seven o'clock in the morning to, and stay closed till the show starts and close at five o'clock in the afternoon. Then the last Saturday, it will close after the session and they will dress the ring and take fix it for Saturday night. And there will be signs posted, and that's on several of the little cards that we give out, the daily schedules. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Um, will there be an exhibitor's gate this year? And if so, where? That's in the same location. It's the, uh, if you come through the bowling alley into what we call our, it's our P lot, there will be a uh, access point there for golf carts. It's really not meant for vehicles. Uh, it is for golf cart traffic coming through. Okay. So so just for just for golf carts. Got it. All right. Um, let's see. I don't have any questions uh, for Sean, but did you want to uh, um, talk to uh, the horse show exhibitors about any enhanced security or anything different from a public safety standpoint uh, that we might expect this year? Uh, well, first and foremost, the um the lot we just spoke of, the P lot, it is being separated so the Kentucky Kingdom guests, there'll be a fence there for this year so that they will not intermingle with, as people drove their golf carts through there, they had to kind of deal with Kentucky traffic that's now been separated with an agreement from them. So they'll be just have their own path and just a little bit of parking in there that keeps that away from them. Uh, other aspects of it is there's key critical security changes that probably would enhance our ability to communicate and interact with state police. I won't get into the finite details of that, but it comes down to radio communications and uh, deployment plans. Uh, we have looked at enhancing that and those arm par and taking place. Uh, furthermore, we still have our juvenile curfew policy, which is in effect and we're hoping to uh, severely mitigate any juvenile related criminal concerns by keeping those out after a certain time, which has been very successful so far. Uh, so that's what I'd like to uh, comment on. Uh, everything else that would be applicable, we do have an emergency notification, which I'll share with you, David, via email. You're welcome to share that with um, all the trainers and really anybody in your entire group. Uh, just they can sign on and get received text messages about any particular weather, lost children, things of that nature, any other public safety concern that would affect the entire fair. So that's a, kind of a digital technical deployment of information. And of course it works two ways. We just ask that people don't chat on it. It's not designed for that and they'll get removed. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, let's see, we have a follow-up. Um, we have follow-up question about the exhibitor's gate uh, from a trainer. Um, is there any way to let vehicles use that uh, gate? Some, some trainers uh, and exhibitors don't have golf carts and have missed their class uh, when the gate uh, backs up. So there's a request to allow exhibitors uh, to uh, drive vehicles uh, through the exhibitor's gate as well as golf carts. Anybody want to take that? Go ahead. David, I, I think we were doing that last year. Uh, I don't encourage that as an avenue to get in, but I understand during peak times and the uh, that roadway was actually cleaned up to kind of make that a little safer. So I, I'm going to say yes. 
Uh, it is designed for golf carts, but it is wide enough for vehicles to get in during peak times and they can bypass that way as long as they have the proper credential. Just keep in mind that what will what'll happen is you'll have normal fair goers that will find that and, and be come, trying to come in that route with ticketing if we open, once it's open for cars. So you'll be, you'll be fighting that and as we will, but that's what we've run into in the past. Perfect, thank you. Um, let's see here. We've got several questions uh, in the Q&A here that have not been addressed. Let me scroll up real quick. I apologize, guys. All right. Um, there's a question about the qualifying point systems uh, possibly not being equitable to those that compete on the maybe West Coast um, or others, other areas of the country that don't have a lot of classes, and it makes it easier to qualify if you're in Kentucky or other areas that have uh, more classes? Uh, is there a way to make the qualifying system more equitable? I don't think so. I mean, you get into the, a lot of situations that come back to haunt you. Uh, we've never had too many people not get qualified. Uh, the first of the Western classes, uh, I know a lot of California people want it. So if anybody has any ideas that will work 100%, let me know. Perfect. Yeah, we'll, we'll solicit those. And if we get something, uh, we'll certainly pass it your way. Um, also, too, can you talk about what classes typically um, are big enough for the qualifying system to come in? Because I, I think uh, people would be surprised about how few classes this really affects. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry, yet. I didn't understand exactly what now. Well, I, I was saying that, you know, we, we have the qualifying system for all pleasure and park classes, but it yeah. really only comes into play for a handful of classes, usually on a typical year. So I, I uh, example for this year, what, what classes do the qualifying uh, even um, come into uh, uh, play as far as turning, turning um, entries away? Oh, I, I very seldom have had to turn any away, basically. Uh, when we first started Western, of course, we only had 16. It was an invitation only, and I did invite people. Um, so, but none of the, uh, very few of them, none of the pleasure, show pleasure or country pleasure, it's a, I've ever got turned away. And I don't turn away kids. I'm sorry, juveniles, I do not turn away because I feel like this might be their only chance to show here. And after they become adults, they either go to school or get a job and they can't do it. So. I don't think I've ever uh, turned a juvenile group away. I know one time I had one kid that the horse had no points at all. It had its six classes, but it didn't evidently hadn't gotten a ribbon. And I let it come. I mean, you know, it, it qualified otherwise. And uh, it hasn't been that many turned away. Okay, I've got a question here about equitation classes. Um, as far as shows all over the country having combined classes, why does the World Championship Horse Show has a, have a class for each age participant? That started out a long time ago when they were, were full. I did combine the 11 and 12 year olds. Uh, the 13 year olds aren't because you have 14 to 17. This year they're pretty well full. And I have discussed it a few times to do it. And of course, trainers don't want it done that way, um, basically. But if they go down, and also I combine the eight and nine, uh, seven and eight year olds, or I did away with the seven year olds after I had one child in it a couple of years. All right, perfect, thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, about um, why the Western class is an invitational and limited to 20 horses when as many as 24 can show per USCF rules. So a question about the Western class, which I guess would apply to the other invitational class too. Well, the, 
they can show 24 in the championship. They can't show in the qualifying class of 20. And that was changed by some people a couple of years ago. Um, so the Western class is not invitational anymore. That was started first and we did it about five years and that's all. It's the Western class is open to anybody that has enough you know, points. Also, a lot of people on these classes, they look at the uh, qualified horses and it may be that maybe their horse is 50 down, but what they don't realize those other 40 don't always enter. So if, if you look at the thing in the first 20 horses, maybe half of them don't even enter, have no intention of coming. Um, so a follow-up question by the same person. So uh, down, down the road, uh, by using the Western uh, Country Pleasure example, <laughs> will the Hunter Division become a regular class and not an invitational? It's not an invitational. It, it doesn't even say invitational. Nothing's ever been said about invitational for the, the Hunter class. Got it. All right, here's a question from another trainer um, about the qualifying. Um, let's see here. Um, because a major show was canceled at the last minute, uh, what, does the cancellation of shows at the last minute impact your decision making on uh, qualifying uh, the deadline as far as possibly extending the deadline or not extending the deadline to canceled classes um, impact that decision making? What I did this year because July went into the week of the last week of June. I, I thought I was doing everybody a favor, but I, it sort of came back to haunt me. Um, I said, okay, if a show started June the 30th and ran to July the 2nd, we would count them. But then some of them got all been out of shape because they wanted June, July the 2nd to count. Well, no, if the show started July the 2nd, that show started in July. That's why I did it. I thought I was being helpful, but I certainly did get a lot of back firing on it that <laughs> makes you change your mind sometimes. Let's see. Um, another uh, question from an exhibitor. Are there plans to send out tickets earlier in the summer? No, because we do it as soon as we can. What tickets? I, I, I'm, I'm guessing the box seat tickets. The, 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 um... I have nothing to do with the box seat timing. That goes to somebody else. Got it. But I think they were a little behind. Everything, it seems like this year, everything's been two weeks behind. I felt like I've been two weeks behind and I, everything everybody else does. I don't know what it is. Maybe we haven't gotten in gear since COVID. All right, um, Ian, there hasn't been any questions about marketing or, or communication around the show. Is there anything you can share with us uh, this year as far as new ways the show is being promoted um, or even some of the things we're, we're working on together with Kentucky Venues uh, on the show? Can you address some of that? Yes, of course. I'm going to scoot in. Hopefully you all can see me. Yeah, here we are. <laughs> um, well, David, I know we've been working closely with your team on bringing some of those press conferences out and driving some more media attention to the property. Uh, right now, we are deep in the weeds with uh, assignment editors from several of the uh, local news outlets and those that reach around the entire state. Uh, in addition to that, we are beginning to um, packet up our media credentials for those that are attending the World's Championship Horse Show. Things have gone very smoothly uh, so far in that regard. Um, we are also working on continually to improve the website. So as people visit the website, certainly we appreciate your feedback. Anything you share with Asha, we'll, we'll work to get as well. Um, beyond that, I think uh, we will be reaching out to people throughout the, the next several days to try to get people interest stories and things that uh, we feel like the media would uh, grab onto to help explain and promote the industry. All right, thank you, Ian. And, and I know uh, we've been working hard um, to position the show as the sporting event that we all know it is, uh, but certainly the general public has kind of gotten away from um, 
of that notion. And um, we're, we're real excited about doing uh, college slash pro sports style press conferences and other things to really elevate uh, the sport, the sporting aspect of the event. So um, thank you, Ian, and thank you to your staff for uh, working with us on that. And, and we're excited about the upcoming, upcoming press conferences and other uh, events we've got planned. So thank you guys, I appreciate that. All right, let's see, we've got a few more questions. Let's see, some of these we've already addressed. Let's see, all right, I'm scrolling down, I apologize. A lot of these we've already addressed. Some people are joining us late here. Let's see. Yep, we've addressed most of those. Scarlett, is there anything else you'd like to say to everybody before we kind of wrap things up? Well, we have a record, I guess, a record number of horses. We numbered 1,900 and about 1,950 of them. Our stalls are over 2,800 which is a lot of stalls. Um, again, as I said earlier, 10 a, m, uh, a and B will be ready tomorrow. They're setting the stalls today. Um, so that wasn't that big a deal. We just look forward to a good show and an exciting show and uh, wish everybody a safe trip and a good time. All right, thank you. And, and here's one last question from a trainer. Uh, about quiet time. Will there be a quiet time um, this year to allow horses to rest? I don't know if they're talking about the North Wing or or what, but um, this was a, a last minute question from a trainer about quiet time. Quiet time? For horses. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't understand what they mean. Unless Scarlet. The quiet time I was thinking about was when they work in there in the afternoon, the first hour after the session is usually a quiet time for a horse not being entertained for, you know, eight and unders, children and so forth. Yeah. Um, and that's what they were talking about. They just texted me. Oh, that, that, that's quiet time they're talking about. Yeah. Yes, there will be. Yes. Okay. And then she said driving horses weren't allowed during this time last year. No, because it, for some reason, the, the buggies and so forth scare the horses or have, so. Okay, that makes sense. Um, anybody else from the team at Kentucky Venues have anything else to add before we uh, wrap things up here? All right. say thank you for the opportunity. We appreciate the dialogue and uh, always welcome feedback and looking forward to a wonderful World Championship Horse Show this year. Well, thank you, Mr. Beck, and, and I really like to thank everyone for uh, joining us today, and a, a special thanks uh, to you, Mr. Beck, and the team at Kentucky Venues and the World Championship Horse Show, and um, as well, I'd like to offer everybody safe travels for everybody coming into Louisville this week and next, and uh, good luck at the show next week, or actually this week. I guess it starts Saturday. That's hard to believe, so we will see you uh, at the uh, World Championship Horse Show soon, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.